Hello, I'm Jessica Lombard, proud superintendent of Huntley School District 158. I'm super excited to be here today for our third episode of Raiders Roundtable. Our discussion today is going to be around a very important topic, meaningful inclusion. Meaningful inclusion, simply put, is creating a sense of belonging, creating a community where meaningful shared learning experiences between individuals are the norm. In order to do this, it requires that we build capacity in all of our educators, students, families, and community members to better understand how we can support each other in a shared commitment to creating a sense of belonging for everyone. Meaningful inclusion is truly the essence of our motto, all students always. Today, I have a very special guest with us. Today, I have our Assistant Superintendent of Special Services, Dee Dee Gill. Dee Dee, welcome today. Thank you, Jessica. I'm very, very excited to be here. Thanks. Dee Dee, this is your second year in the district, but you come with a wealth of knowledge and experiences, especially around this topic. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Yes. So this is my 25th year in education. I have always really been in the area of special education. I started as a speech pathologist and really fell in love with the uh, complexity of working with teams and families and uh, coming to the table to lead problem solving and, and really working with, with families to make sure students had access to their learning and, and community. So uh, I've been a special education coordinator, been an assistant director and an assistant principal. I've been an, uh, a director of special education and now I'm in this role of assistant superintendency. So I, I come here, uh, was very excited to come here for that very reason you talked about around supporting all students always. So, Didi, you right now under your umbrella is um, technically special education, but when you think of special services, it's more than, while it's not necessarily your role, you collaborate and you work very closely with other directors and assistant superintendents. What's that term, um, special services, really entail? Yeah. For me, that means that we're supporting all students, student services, so programs that will support uh, both the student services side of things and the special education side of things. Um, so student services and special education combined really um, as an umbrella uh, that you know, when I think about an assistant superintendent for special services, it's, it's really the combination of both. How do we um, provide for all and provide some additional special education services? We talked about in, in one of my intro, um, I mentioned just shared learning experiences. When you hear the words meaningful inclusion, what does that mean to you? Well, you captured it really well in, in talking about the, it's really the art of human connection and creating sense of belonging and community for all people. And so meaningful inclusion is just that, it's that. I, at its core, uh, it is our responsibility to ensure that all uh, individuals feel seen and heard and have voice and, and ultimately does come down to building a sense of belonging. Think about our classrooms. You walk in and out of the, mm -hmm. the classrooms and you talked about, you said the word individuals, right? Our mm -hmm. motto is all students always, but when we think about it, it really is all individuals yep. always. And we want to make sure that everybody has that sense of belonging. So walking into our buildings or maybe it's on our campuses, in our gymnasiums, on our buses, what does meaningful inclusion look like? What, could, what are some examples? Yeah. I think it can look like a lot of things, many of which are very simple. It's walking into a space and um, being greeted. It's, it's um, knowing that regardless of who you are and how you present, that you're going to walk into a space where you're invited and welcomed and that we're seeking to understand each other. So I think about walking through the hallways and um, and seeing students, you know, greeting each other, staff greeting each other in classrooms, working together, and and not not that we are always agreeing on all things, but that when we're not, we're working to understand each other and and understand shared perspectives on things, so that we can grow as individuals. That's true for students and and staff and and families. Yeah. 
So when I think about walking into um, our school buildings, usually in that vestibule area mm-hmm. of each of the schools, I, I see a banner. Mm-hmm. And in there, it's kind of a welcome banner in multiple languages, many, because we have a lot of families. Yeah. It's those things that you do from the onset of walking in to give that sense of you matter, you belong here, and giving them that comfort level. It also then starts to spark the conversation um, around, okay, it might be, what's this language? And we're learning about those things. Um, Think about, as you walk into some of our special education classrooms or even our gen ed classrooms, Mm -hmm. take the lens of our students with special needs. And what are some Mm -hmm. things that um, we do here in our district to really help um, this meaningful inclusion? Yeah, I think we do a lot of things. I think we're, we're... Uh, We're intentional about making sure that we are inviting feedback and inviting opportunity to grow together. I think in our classrooms, we're looking at what specialized uh, tools, equipment, instructional models, what are the things that we can do to create access for Mm -hmm. all students. And, uh, And I think it's really important that we as leaders are really looking at ways to do that proactively, Mm -hmm. where we're thinking ahead of time, what could this look like? Um, Perspective taking um, from a student's perspective, from a staff's perspective, what would help you gain access uh, to your learning or your play or your just your peer interactions or your your staff interactions. So we we see a lot of specialized equipment. We see a lot of uh, specialized instructional tools. I think about things like at Dyke Park, we have our sensory playgrounds and it makes so much sense, right? It builds uh, unique opportunities for students to engage. Last summer, we as a district installed communication boards Mm -hmm. on each of our playgrounds and it was really wonderful. It, It really bridged a gap in communication for some of our students who are non-speaking or who require some support for communication. Didi, can you share with our listeners and viewers out there Mm -hmm. of what do those boards look like on our playground? Yeah. So there are structures that that resemble communication devices that some of our students may use. Uh, they have pictures that our students are familiar with because they uh, they are on the devices that they use on a regular basis. So they have um, their standing structures where kids can go up to them and, and physically can touch a picture to communicate an idea. So the idea there is that students have a mechanism to you know, communicate with their peers and understand that there are differences in the way we communicate. So uh, it, it really kind of normalizes that all of us have mm-hmm. unique communication and um, it really provides that opportunity for students to engage with each other. It was exciting to see those go up mm-hmm. this year uh, yeah. for all of our students at yeah. our buildings. Yeah, they're, they're really neat structures, and, and they're you know different sizes and different heights for our early childhood versus our elementary uh, school students. And we worked with our assistive um, technology and our AAC facilitators in the district who really specialize in how can we make communication more accessible for all. So it was a really great project and mirrors some of the things we're seeing in our community uh, like the sensory playgrounds. And, you know, you'll see in, in our district uh, things like buddy benches, which are, is, is such a simple way to invite um, students together to have conversations. We'd love to see that in our community mm-hmm. as well so that we're really beginning to bridge opportunities with community and, and make it um, available for all. Again, those are examples of intentional things that were um, identified and providing the most authentic experiences for our students. And while some of those are more elementary in level, we mm-hmm. have examples of meaningful inclusion in, in all of our grade levels, in all yeah. of our buildings. But yeah. I see it in the high school, too, and when, when we're looking at the way that we design our, our um, cafeterias and our learning spaces, it, it really is about how do we make sure it is a place where all students can come together and engage. And um, the more we do that in schools and in our community, the more we become really the experts in how to interact with each other as, as humans. Yeah. And, and you've even been into some of our classrooms. You talked about about the high school of we want to make sure that we're able to provide access. So if it's the just the unsure of how to be able mm-hmm. to do that, you've been in rooms, you've been in art rooms and yeah. um, the, the foods classroom mm-hmm. and providing by doing these small, simple things, mm-hmm. we're able to just shift an experience yeah. that allows that accessibility for yeah. our students. And I love that 
that you talk about shifting experience. I think sometimes as educators, when we don't know how do I make this more inclusive for a student, if we start with how do I build community, mm-hmm. if I shifted the question, how would I build community in my classroom, um, I'm not alone in that work. It's right. all of us as students. So I, I can lean into my students and say, how do we build community in our classroom? And in doing that, how do we build a sense of belonging? Mm-hmm. And kids have the answers more than we do often. And so I think that's I a love that you bring that up that. because it is. It's not just on one person. It's not just on the teacher. It's just not right. on you as a role. It's all of us, including the students. So 100%. thank you for sharing that. Yeah. But it, it, in the... Um, Kind of in the end, it's it's all about how are we proactively thinking about engagement and, and inclusion and belonging. So if there are learning needs, um, maybe there are um, different um, educational, social, emotional, all kinds of different needs that we need to be able to break down those barriers and to provide access. And so typically you hear meaningful inclusion and you think right away mm. that's in our special education realm. Yeah. And it is, but it's truly for all. Think about our dual language, yeah. our um, multilingual families, our gifted. What does mm-hmm. that look like in the school setting to provide opportunities for them to be able to access their learning? Yeah, I actually think that's the best question because you're right. So many people hear meaningful inclusion and they associate it with special education, but we are. We're talking about all student groups, all individuals. And so I think when we're when we're talking about our planning and our our um, decision making that it's it's a truly collaborative process where we're involving all of our departments and all of our schools and taking consideration for all of our age groups, mm-hmm. um, all of the differences, and really leveraging the strengths we have and uh, and taking the opportunities to learn from each other. How to ensure that every student's needs are met so we create access. I think about building foundational skills. So mm-hmm. we see uh, when we're supporting behavior and social emotional learning, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time talking about champs and stoic and what does that mean for all students? That's uh, universal for all, right? And, and then in addition to that, some of our students need more, whether they're um, a student who's an English learner or a student who's gifted or a student who's in special education. That really represents the part of the equation where we say access to for all, and some of our our students need more. And so I think we, we really try hard to make sure that we've considered, uh, you know, access to everything and what are those additional supports. In order to do that, needs change all the time. Yeah. Our learners are changing. We as adults are changing. So um, trying to, to first identify needs and then how do we address uh, those needs takes professional development, right? So there's that constant conversation. How do we in our district go about um, providing an understanding and professional development for our staff? And how does it then trickle over to our families as well? Yeah, Yeah, I think one of the things I'm most excited about is the partnership that curriculum instruction has with special services. We sit at the table and we are learning together how do we do this uh, well across the board for students. And I I say that, we also make sure that we're partnering with human resources and fiscal and communication to make sure we've considered all of the different um, perspectives on how do we build um, supports for all students. So I am really excited that when we sit down together as a team in our learning and innovation department, uh, that we're able to look at what are the professional learning experiences or development opportunities we're providing for staff, how do we embed these principles of meaning, meaningful inclusion so that we provide access for all, how are we doing that with intention. So I feel really good about that and, and we're really trying to uh, spend intentional time when we're looking at our professional development plan for the district. In addition to that, we are really fortunate to have a family engagement liaison. Mm -hmm. She is uh, an extension of that, really, to say, yes, these are the professional learning experiences we have for staff, and we want to extend that out to our families and our students to say, how do we, you know, how do we collectively learn about this? So she's had um, a great opportunity to bring in wonderful speakers, um, recently brought in the authors for The Way to Inclusion and and had an opportunity to bring over 200 individuals uh, together to learn. So we, we do um, a lot of those um, events both during the you know the workday and outside of the workday. You said intentional, mm-hmm. right? We can 
think often that we know what it is exactly that our staff might need or families might need, students might need. Um, but you talked about bringing in the authors and having over 200 mm -hmm. people, uh, either in person or Virtual. virtually coming together uh, to talk about meaningful inclusion and kind of setting that foundation um, and where to go from there. So really understanding that. But it wasn't just staff. Right. There were families that were also part of that. So that intentionality is really including all of those voices together so that we know where we need to go. Yeah. we let, uh, So last year when I started, I uh, had a really great opportunity to meet with families who, who are in our district. We have our special education advisory committee came together and, and really spoke to what their experiences and perspectives were, what their needs were. And, um, and from that, we really developed what, what are the places where we can grow as a district to um, promote meaningful inclusion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was one of the things that we really wanted to make sure we were even more intentional about coming into this year. So there, you know, the, the planning that we're doing and the people who we're bringing in to offer this professional uh, learning development is really um, stems from that feedback from families and staff and students. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that because we're, we are being intentional. And the more intentional we are, the better we'll do. We have our grad program and mm -hmm. it's recognizing American diversity. You talked about the authors who had came in right before that. You yeah. had a very interesting, um, it, for that month, uh, RAD event. And we have mm -hmm. these on a, a monthly basis. There are some yeah. months that we don't. And it's really to build understanding and to help um, cultivate that sense of belonging and understanding. But you tied in the community. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about why bringing in the community not only for that event, but in the discussion around meaningful inclusion yeah. is so important. Yeah, it's really critical. Our community is an extension of us. We are the community. And so we uh, we invited community members or partners, organizations and businesses to come in and highlight what they're doing to build belonging mm -hmm. and to build inclusion uh, so that all families have access. And so we were intentional about how, what are we doing in the community to build accessibility um, to promote independence in living, in learning, and in rec leisure, and in, in employment. All of the, all of the places that uh, require us to think with intention. And so we invited um, our business community, uh, our organizations in, to both highlight and also use it as an opportunity to seek feedback from our families and students. So every table had a QR code where mm -hmm. families could give feedback on what would make this business or organization more accessible. It's a way for us to improve our partnership. We have great partners and we want to see those continue to, to build. The importance of that is so we can build capacity and opportunity for all individuals to um, be part of our community in the most um, you know, person-centered way. And, um, and so we have great capacity. That same week, there was an event held with American Eagle. And actually, um, that shopping experience, again, accessibility, providing an authentic, meaningful um, experience, came actually from conversation from our families yep. to the employees of that store, yep. connecting with our liaison yep. for family engagement. Why is that um, something that we should highlight, and how yeah. do we keep that momentum going? Yeah, that it's um, so that that was such a, a great moment. It was, uh, as you know, it was it was such a, a wonderful event. It was, I think, from a district perspective, we're really committed to making sure we're listening to our families, that we have a mechanism for them to get to us to to share their voice, and that we're doing something with that, and that we're reaching out and building connections. So when Jill, uh, our family engagement liaison, came to me to talk about this opportunity. We were absolutely on board, mm -hmm. and um, there was a, a lot of behind-the-scenes work just to try to, to make sure that we were bridging all the, um, the gaps that might exist. We met with American Eagle ahead of time, shared with them just some information about how to um, – you know, how to create a sensory safe shopping experience, what considerations might they have, what questions might they have. We want to normalize really the conversations around how do we support. Mm -hmm. I think just as humans, we are naturally driven to, to support and help 
sometimes we don't know how. And so normalizing, it's okay to ask questions. So in that particular um, experience, it was fantastic. American Eagle stepped up and said, okay, what can we do? Uh, families came. They they got to have an individualized experience, but also very age typical and very mm-hmm. appropriate. Uh, and they, I, I you know from from watching and, and being there, watching our families and, and hearing from them, they felt um, included and they felt a sense of belonging and ask for more. And so I think from a district perspective, it's about how do we give them more? It's our commitment, but also our follow through on continuing to expand those partnerships. Did you, in in uh, your discussion there, you talked about that sometimes we just don't know. Mm-hmm. In this case, it was beautiful. It came from a family and it was brought, how can we do this? So again, it's that collaborative partnership. How? What advice would you have for, for parents um, who might feel, we talk about this sense of belonging, but my student doesn't feel mm-hmm. that they belong or that mm-hmm. um, they matter what advice do you give to families so that we can open that dialogue? Because we truly are here to yeah. partner and help. Yeah, I think it's inviting the conversation at home and in schools uh, to acknowledge that sometimes the questions are hard and they make us uncomfortable mm-hmm. because we don't know if uh, if the questions we're asking um, will maybe hurt someone's feelings or make us um, sound like we don't know what we're talking about. I mean, none of us know all the answers. Uh, but what I do know in talking with our, our families on a regular basis, our families want to have mm-hmm. conversation. They want us to better understand how to support um, their students. And so I encourage families to, to have the conversations, ask the questions um, when they're not sure what questions to ask. Um, partner up with someone who, who can help. Um, I think the, the biggest piece of advice would be um, not to ignore the, the, the conversation because uncomfortable conversations is where we grow mm-hmm. and, uh, and it's okay to not have the answers, but we do need to seek the answers. That, that's something I think we can teach all of We teach each other that. We have a variety of different um, parent and staff groups in our district. We have the PTAC, which is Mm -hmm. our Parent Teacher Advisory Committee. Um, We have our SEAC Mm -hmm. for Special Services, our MPAC, all Mm -hmm. of these acronyms, right, Uh, for our multilingual families. Um, We have opportunities around curriculum and instruction and workshops. Um, I know that not everybody has the the time and availability to come when Mm -hmm. those are set. But um, we do offer opportunities for feedback. So even if they can't participate in the physical setting of those meetings, um, that the the door is always open, if you will, the phone yeah. or whatnot, to be able to to share. Because I think what I want our families and our students um, to know is that we're always listening. Yeah. When you think about that for staff, staff voice is extremely important. And um, we've seen a, a shift with some of the things that um, – we do on some of our professional development days yeah. so that staff really can share yeah. what they're seeing and what their needs are, too. Can you tell me yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah. Last year, I think we had some really great conversations. We brought in our um, – we did some more vertical alignment, right? So we have some specialized programs to support our complex learners, and we were able to bring our, our self-contained teachers together really all in the same room. Let's talk about what's going well. Where do we need alignment? Getting feedback so that when we came into this year, we were able to plan with that in mind. Uh, So that was um, really a great starting point. We did that with our self-contained teachers and we brought in our paraprofessionals and and really targeting the experiences they're having so we can get more vertical alignment. Those those have been some great opportunities for voice. That's awesome. I know in just talking with you here today, but On a regular basis, Um, you are so passionate about meaningful inclusion. We truly want those authentic shared learning experiences. If our students don't feel that they belong and that they are part of this community, um, they're not going to learn at their optimum level. If our staff don't feel like that, they're not going to perform, whether it's, you know, on a bus or in the Mm -hmm. cafeteria or the classroom. So if you had one or two takeaways that you Mm. just, in terms of meaningful inclusion, that you would want Mm. those that are listening to hear, what would that be? Uh, It would be that we're all in this together, that this is all of our work um, collectively, and that none of us have all of the answers, but collectively when we come together, we have more of them, and that this really is what we do. This is 
our calling. This is uh, why we educate students and why we come together as a district to support all students always. I, I believe in that statement. I believe, it, you know, fundamentally, mm-hmm. this is all of our work. And um, I think that that's the takeaway, that it's, it's not special services work and it's not curriculums work and it's not the teachers or the admin. It, it's all of us, it's our everyone. community. Didi, I thank you so very much for joining us today on this this episode. Um, Again, this work is going to continue throughout this year and into the future because it does really impact all of us. And so, again, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your your passion, and your experiences Mm -hmm. and helping drive this work forward um, as we, you know, continue through this school year. Well, I want to thank you, too, because I do want to acknowledge that in doing this work and, and leading and asking the hard questions, it takes this type of conversation with district leaders and with community members. And I know you lead that all of the time. And I, I genuinely appreciate that this is something you believe in and that we are able to move forward um, together. So thank you. We've got this together. I know yes. we do. I would like to thank Dee Dee Gill for joining us today on our episode, as well as thank the Huntley Area Public Library for the use of this great recording studio. But before signing off, Here's a little fun fact about Huntley 158. Did you know two of our local businesses right downtown in our Huntley Square used to have basketball played above them? On the second floor of both Stroh's Furniture and Sal's Pizza way before it was Sal's Pizza probably have remnants of an old gym floor. Thank you for tuning into Huntley 158's Raiders Roundtable where it's all students always. Until next time, 